And before he waves his hand to materialize Vibhuti, he looks at me and puts up his sleeve. And then he pauses and I was at the, dis at the height of his palm. So instead of doing the routine circular movement, he just did this. And I actually watched the Vibhuti piling up from the middle of his palm. And I take the letter and go to Swami in Brindavan to just tell him that this offer has come Swami and I thought he'll be so happy when I tell him I'm going to America. And Swami comes, he takes the letter, leaves Swami and go and he threw that letter. Sarvarupadharam Shivam Sarvanamadharam Satyam Satchidananda Rupa Dvaitam Satyam Shivam Sundaram All the names are the names of Swami. All forms are forms of Sai. He is being, awareness and bliss. He is truth, oneness and beauty. Even before I attempt to get started, I wish to say that we must first understand what is this phenomenon called Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba, who has been a friend to a few, mother to most of us, a guiding father, a guru, Satguru, and Bhagavan himself. What is this phenomenon? Who is this Satya Sai Baba who is revered across the entire planet, who is revered by millions for several yugas and who will continue to be revered as the cosmic consciousness? Who is this Satya Sai Baba? I want to straight away narrate a small incident which revealed this truth to me. It was one afternoon in Prashanti Nilayam. It seemed like any other normal afternoon. Bhagwan beautifully glided into Sai Kulvanthal and as he came near the veranda, he gently said, go in. And once I was there inside, Swami engaged in a conversation about the greatness of the land of Bharat. And suddenly, he says, go to the window and look out. It is going to start raining. And I go to the window and suddenly there is a lot of rain from out of the blue. Heavy showers pelting on the sacred roofs of Kulvanthal creating the aura of sacredness as if washing the holy feet of Sai. And then Swami said, now it will become very hot and sunny. Suddenly the rain stops and then there is a bright sunshine. The sun god had come to kiss the feet of Sai. And then he says, now there will be a lot of wind. And he said it so naturally. And then I look out and suddenly there is a heavy, heavy burst of wind. The force of the wind was so severe. From that window in the interview room, I could actually see the sleeves on the shirts of the students fluttering who were sitting in the front. And then Swami very casually says, like this, the sun god, wind god, rain god, this god, that god, keep coming to have my darshan, but I don't allow anyone to come near me. I have given that opportunity to you all. And instantly then, he declares, 
సర్వదేవతాతీత స్వరూప ధారించి మానవకారమే ఈ ఆకారము ఆల్ ద ఫార్మ్స్ ఆఫ్ డివినిటీ నోన్ అన్నోన్ కవర్ట్ అవర్ట్ కాన్షియస్ ఎవ్రీ సింగిల్ ఫార్మ్ ఆఫ్ డివినిటీ బై ఎనీ నేమ్ దట్ యూ కాల్ ఎనీ ఫార్మ్ దట్ యూ కాల్ ఎన్ అడ్రస్ ఈస్ ప్రెజెంట్ ఇన్ దిస్ ఫార్మ్ ఆఫ్ సాయి దిస్ ఈజ్ భగవాన్ శ్రీ సత్య సాయి బాబా ది కాస్మిక్ కాన్షియస్నెస్ ది అబ్సల్యూట్ ట్రూత్ the one without whom there is nothing else that is possible on this cosmos this is our swami who suddenly comes down to the level of a human becomes one with us plays with us sings with us becomes a friend becomes a mother becomes a father and yet and yet we keep wanting evidence and proof of divinity time and again time and again time and again i have never been an exception to this in my earlier years when i came to swami i used to always have an apprehension and this kind of a notion is probably there in a lot of us though bhagwan's dividend is evident the moment you have his darshan the moment you look at the form you know this is not just a sadguru this is something beyond that but still there is a notion there is a feeling there is an apprehension there is a doubt there are rumors so i also had this apprehension and i used to have so many thoughts entertained in my mind and swami cleared all this in one day in brindavan in 1991 the samiti to which i used to go then the convener called me in the afternoon and said there is an air commodore who wishes to have bhagwan's darshan and he has actually come with a donation to hand over to swami so will you come with us you need to drive the car you know the first thought that came to my mind the first thought that struck me the corrupted human mind so to speak ah this is a man who has come to hand over a donation to swami now i have heard that swami is someone who interacts with the rich and famous so i thought if i go with this man to brindavan there is a guaranteed chance of me getting an immediate proximity to swami for some reason swami is going to call this man and talk to him and shower on him and that is the bonanza i am getting today so i immediately agreed to go and all three of us go to whitefield and that was time when the present sai ramesh hall the darshan hall if some of you have noticed it there was not there there was an old sai ram shed under a tree and bhagwan is to come there and give darshan so we were made to sit in the first row the convener this air commodore and next to him i also got a chance because i had driven them and i was absolutely sure this is going to be my day and even before coming there there was another thought which i had entertained in my mind because i had read about it i had heard people talking about it i had heard rumors that bhagwan baba actually does not materialize vibhuti out of his own will but bhagwan baba has got a secret mechanism to materialize this vibhuti so with all these thoughts the monkey mind as swami would call it we were seated there and swami came graciously so beautifully he glided into ramesh hall and as he came near the air force commodore the convener got up and introduced him and he said swami wants to offer a small token of his love at your lotus feet and this man had actually carried the cash in his hand and he was offering it swami touched the packet and said your mother is not well and you will need this money for her treatment raklo and immediately after that he waves his hand and before he waves his hand to materialize vibhuti he looks at me puts up his sleeve 
And then he pauses, and I was at the, dis at the height of his palm, so instead of doing the routine circular movement, he just did this. And I actually watched the vibhuti piling up from the middle of his palm. And then he gives the entire vibhuti to the air commodore, sprinkles whatever else is left on his fingers on him, clenches his fist, keeps it back to him, looks at me and walks away. As if to say, you doubting Thomas, two doubts got cleared. Sai is not for money. Sai is the eternal protector. Sai is the mother. He is the embodiment of pure love. And that is all he is. He is not someone who needs to come and materialize objects. It happens out of his instant will. It is his sankalpa which creates all this. It is not a mechanism which creates all this. Two doubts got cleared. Then we were ushered into Bhagwan's residences, which is in Thrai, away from the public darshan hall. Once we were there, Swami was in the garden and he was distributing laddus to everybody. And Swami had his typical gracious way of doing this. So he would take a laddu from a plate and throw it and it would perfectly go and land within the palms of the person who was supposed to get it. So he was actually giving laddu like this and three of us were standing at a distance and just then I saw the chief minister of the state ushered in by a few senior devotees also coming in from another side and he came and stood there and then I said, Are, now my chance to get the laddu is probably gone. Because Swami, you know, the rich and famous, this is the mad mind which is still working. He proves it to me just a few minutes ago that he is not someone who is for the rich and famous. But again the mad mind erupts. So I am standing there and I actually put back my hands like this because I am convinced that I will not get the laddu now. And Swami is throwing the laddus to everybody. And then automatically when you look at his form, your palms go up in Namaskar. And the moment I did this, I found there was a laddu in my palm. Now I am standing at a distance. I am nowhere close to him. And there is a laddu there. This happens in 1991. I will straight away take you to 2009 now, 18 years. Swami had given us an opportunity to get 85 boys in whose houses we did a special Ekadasha Rudram chanting and he said, you bring all these boys to Prashanti Nilayam, I want them to chant in front of me in the Bhajan Mandir. So all these 85 boys were brought and Swami very graciously one evening at almost half past six or quarter to seven, he permitted all of us to go into the Bhajan Mandir and he sat through the entire Rudram chanting, guided them minutely pointed out so many nuances in Rudram chanting, how it has to be uttered, what is the exact methodology, what is the system of commencing the mantra, what is the system of concluding the mantra, what should be the posture, what should be the bhava within. He went on guiding them, he moved amongst the boys, he took a lot of letters from the boys who had doubts on the Vedic symbols involved in Rudram and after all this was done, once the program concluded, we had organized uh, Obbattu. Obbattu is uh, Puranpoli. Maharashtra's Puranpoli is Obbattu. Obbattu Prasadam was organized that day to be distributed to the entire crowd. So once the Rudram program got over, Swami said, distribute the Prasadam to everyone. So we got the first bowl blessed by him and then the prasadam was taken out and distributed to the entire crowd. And then we came back and reported to Swami sincerely. Swami, the way you said, the prasadam has been distributed to all the people in the crowd. And Swami said, but I didn't get even one. And immediately he quips, this is where divinity is present. On that day, you didn't ask, but I gave you the laddu. Today, you didn't think of me, but I am asking you for the Obattu. 
This is after 18 years. 1991, 2009, Sai is beyond our comprehension. Swami cannot be limited to this body. Swami cannot be limited to just this form. Swami cannot be limited to the human mind. Swami is much, much, much more and beyond all this. All that we need to do, I think, is surrender and accept the divinity as the first step. When I was in my seventh standard, my mother took me to the residence of a senior trustee of the Satisai Trust then, in whose house Bhagwan had graciously visited, Mr. Prasad. By the time we reached, the bhajans were over and uh, Aarti was being offered to Swami inside the residence. So we were standing right outside the door, entrance door. Swami accepted Aarti and then he was coming out. And as he came out, and my mother was very fortunate to have received his grace and blessings on quite a few occasions. So when he saw her, he immediately came near her and she had taken me and I had gone there most reluctantly because I never believed that this is God. In fact, I was told at home by my grandmother that this is a magician and don't allow his eyes to look directly into your eyes because he'll hypnotize you. So I was actually standing behind my mother and then my mother brings me to the front and says, Swami, I don't know what to do with him. He's always playing only cricket, only cricket, only cricket. He doesn't study at all. You only have to take care. And instantly he materializes Vibhuti, puts it on my head and rubs and tells her, I will take care of him. This happened in the seventh standard. There was no interaction with Swami after that. Once I finished my graduation, I lost my mother quite early in life. And when she passed away, I had this anger within. The anger was, this so-called Sai Baba, Swami used to go, I mean my mother used to go to Swami and he used to shower so much love on her and all that and she believed in him. Then why did he have to take her away? Why could he not have just allowed her to be for a few more years? So this anger was there. It was bubbling within. But I couldn't show it out. It was always there within me. And then in 1990, my sister, one afternoon she says, we need to go to Whitefield. Sai Baba is there and somebody needs to be dropped there, some elderly couple. Since you have got your driving license now, you need to drive the car. So I was very excited because I had got a driving license this then and I was so happy to be driving the car. So I said, let us go. So we go to Whitefield. And after reaching the ashram, I told my sister, I will not come in. You go and take these people inside because he is the one who took away my mother. How can I come and have his darshan? He did not even have the mercy to keep her alive for a few more years. So I sat back in the car and they all went inside. And after a few minutes, I noticed in the rear seat, there was a purse of that lady who had gone in. And I thought it is my duty to take that purse and give it to her. So I take that purse and go into the ashram. And when I go into the ashram, the seva, they just come, 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 come. And they just ushered me and made me sit in one place, right at the corner, where the sand was there those days. It was not within the inner circle, outside. And Swami comes and then I am caught. I can't even get up and go out now. So I am right there. Swami comes. And what happened was, when he comes from Thrai Brindavan from his residence, the sand portion actually is the first area which he will encounter. Then he will go into the hall. So he has to cross that area. So I was there and as he was nearing, I was actually clenching my fist and I said, this is the chance. Let me get up and shout at him. Let me tell him and ask him, why did he do this to me? Why did he take away my mother? Because anger. Anger is there. The Krodha is there. Swami neared and as he neared, I went up on my knees. And I said, my mother passed away, Swami. And he instantly says, but I am there for you. 
in English. And this is the connect which he keeps on keeping. He gave a promise to her, I will take care of him. When I go and encounter him, his instant word is, I am there for you. What I am trying to bring forth here is, Sai is not someone who just comes into our life and goes out of our life as we may want to choose it. Sai is someone who once he chooses to enter into our life, he will stay put. Whether we accept him or not, he will stay put. He has an agenda, he has a work to perform on each one of us. He has decided, it is his sankalpa that we are in his fold. It is his sankalpa that we have got attracted to this form and realize the divinity in this form. He will never let go. We may run away, but he will not let go of us, ever. In 1992, I have such fond memories of this session today in Dharmakshetra. In fact, 1992, Swami visited Mumbai, January I think, and that year, out of the blue in the darshan, he tells me, Bombay, just before the trip to Bombay was planned. And I was wondering what it meant, I didn't know, but I assumed that when he said Bombay, it means that I am supposed to travel to Bombay. So I went and searched and asked my convener of the Samiti. He said, sir, this is what Swami mentioned today, so what am I supposed to do? He said, no, no, Bhagwan is planning to go to Bombay. So maybe he was indicating you should also go. I will check and let you know what is the journey, the itinerary. And those days, I used to file some income tax returns for these Indian Airlines people, staff, senior staff. So once I got to know that Swami was traveling to Mumbai, I persuaded with them and they helped me get a ticket in the same row in which Swami was seated. Because I think row number 7A, Swami was seated, 7B, 7C was Colonel Jogarao, 7D and then 7E I got. So, that was a big, big, big push for me because I felt, oh, this is the chance I am traveling with Swami. In the flight, Swami made me do a lot of sevadal work. A lot of people were coming to get pictures autographed, signed and all that. He said, hey, get up, crowd control check. So I was actually standing and controlling people and doing this and he taught me some beautiful lessons in that process. All this went on for some time. Then he called the crew, he took pictures with them and he was showering love on everyone. There was a passenger who had wanted to get his daughter's mangalyam blessed. Swami moved towards him, blessed the mangalyam, gave him vibhuti, was giving darshan within the flight. All this happened. And then finally when he came and settled down in his seat just before the landing, I said, Swami, where do I stay in Dharmakshetra? I have assumed that I am also going to be in Dharmakshetra with him. I have assumed. Because the ego, the ahankaram in you, assumes that just because Swami gives you a chance to travel with Him, that everything else is also falling in place. So I asked Him just before landing, Swami, Dharmakshetra, where am I supposed to stay? You are going to be in Dharmakshetra, where will I stay? Where is my room in Dharmakshetra? And Swami said, there is no need for you to come to Dharmakshetra. And I was wondering, what is this? I mean, I have come to Mumbai and uh, I don't know anybody here. I had some 380 rupees with me. The ticket was courtesy Indian Airlines because of income tax returns. I didn't know what to do. I said, once we land there and then the flight lands and I see a lot of people coming in cars there to take Swami and Swami is getting ready to leave and no indication, nothing, and I was completely lost. Suddenly it turns back and says, you go to Shirdi. Shirdi ghogbitu, vapas hogvaga nanjote bai, he said. You go to Shirdi, and when you are returning, you come back with me. That was my first trip in my life to Shirdi. It was a very memorable trip. I had a blissful time in Shirdi. The pain was there that I was not part of Swami's entourage which came to Dharmakshetra. 
but there was a blessing that maybe the some dues were there from the earlier form to me so i had a wonderful trip i came back and then i was desperately trying to find out what is swami's program to return back to bangalore because he said you come back with me and uh, i tried my best i just couldn't access anybody because you have to understand that at a certain point in time you simply accept the words of the divine and you just wait saburi is the divine lesson so you just wait with patience when grace has to come it will come it has to come because it is chosen it is destined that it has to be conferred on you there is no point in our hurrying up you may stand upside down nothing is going to happen in a in, in you know any other speed other than god speed so by a divine turn of events i was able to get a booking on the flight in which bhagwan was returning and the moment i sat down and swami came into the aircraft and he entered and he sat down and after they closed the cabin door he knew exactly i was wondering swami has not seen where i am seated but he had spotted because he had willed that you have to be on that flight and he knew exactly where you are sometimes we may wonder that god is not responding to my prayer god is not responding to me visually symbolically but god need not respond to us because he is not outside of us he is within us since he is part of us there is no question of god having to respond since he knew that his sankalpa will achieve that trip of mine back to bangalore with him he knew exactly where i was seated suddenly he turns and he calls in the aircraft for swami the aircraft is like another dharmakshetra or kulvant hall or ramesh hall or something like that darshan so he calls when i went he says very bad I said what happened swami who asked you to go first to the samadhi mandir first you should go to dwarka mine and i got a jolt i said my god because i had actually gone first to the samadhi mandir for darshan and then i went to dwarka mai this was my first visit to shirdi i didn't know the rules i didn't know what it was to actually go there and what are you supposed to do later on i read in the satcharitra that dwarka mai was the place where every devotee would first come and offer his obeisances to bhagwan there the samadhi mandir came only towards the end after his body was shed so swami immediately said why did you go to the samadhi mandir you should have gone to dwarka mai this is omniscience the divine lord bringing forth another example of guiding and telling you i am not just this form that you are watching i am the inner consciousness which is within you i am the very thought process in you i am you and you are me this is the lesson he has been trying to drive home time and again time and again time and again but somehow man with all his inadequacies doesn't want to rise up we don't want to rise up i think that is where the question is we don't want to we have become stubborn we feel no i it's better that i am here and i keep on worshiping swami and saying praying to him and actually practicing dvaita while professing to follow advaita life continued 92 was the shirdi trip my brother today told me you have to talk about athirudram Athirudram is a very very touching personal experience which i think not just in this birth but in births and lifetimes i will never 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 be able to ever get a moment as cherished as that but after that in 93 swami arranged my marriage he blessed us he got us married and i had a grouse against him in 93 he said i will get you married he blessed us in brindavan he chose the bride for me he told their parents this is the husband for your girl all this was done he fixed up the date of the marriage and that morning all of us relatives gather and go and sit in brindavan hoping swami will actually call us and get us married in the kalyan mandap and it didn't happen and swami comes and says 
you go to the Shirdi Sai Baba temple near your house. There was a Shirdi Sai Baba temple near my house in Bangalore. He says, you go there and get married there. So I was actually angry. I said, what is this? You call us here, you call all relatives, you fix up everything and now you straight away pass on the buck on your previous incarnation. How can this happen? So this grouse was there, but then Bhagwan is so beautiful, so loving, so enchanting that the next darshan, everything is forgotten. I mean, that form has got that, that feeling. Once you look at him, you forget everything. No anger, no grouse, nothing comes. You just go back to being yourself. So that anger was there on that day. We went to the Shirdi Sai temple. We did whatever ceremonies had to be done. But I told my father, I said, I will not do that going around the fire and all those traditional things which have to be done. I will get married because you all have told me to get married and Swami has also guided me to get married. But I will not do all those ceremonial things. But we will get married. So he said, you at least get married. Finish that part. So we finished the ceremonial part. This is in 93, 2006, when this yagnam started. Swami called us in and he says, Oh, you are angry that I didn't get you married. And then he performs the entire marriage in the interview room. He materialized the mangalyam for her. He did everything for me. And then he sits there and says, Now you go around me. And then, to top it, he finally says, today sweets have been distributed to all the people because today it is your marriage. And on that day, out of the blue, prasadam was being distributed. There was no function, nothing. Prasadam was being distributed to the entire public. Now, this is what, 13 years. He will never forget. A word given, a promise made, he will never, never, never forget. We may forget. Swami, it is a stamp of divinity, divine assurance. Years rolled on. My father passed away in 97. And after he passed away, you know, a lot of maturity comes into you. The father, the mother have all passed away, the guiding forces in your life. And I was still very young. And once he passed away, I was wondering, maybe life has come to a standstill now. I don't know how to proceed. So I go to Prashanti Nilayam and I said, ultimate recourse is only to go to Bhagwan. I go there and Swami just didn't respond. There was nothing. I mean, there was not even a recognition. There was not even a word spoken. There was not even an indication. Absolutely nothing. And then we come back to Bangalore. And then life goes on, 98, 99. And then slowly some group came and said, why don't we all start doing Grama Seva? So we all got into Seva. Seva in a big way. Swami motivated it and we got it done. In 2000, he blessed the first major Grama Seva project in Bangalore. He guided us minutely, very, very minutely. He blessed profusely and he showed his visible presence in the village where we went. All the villages that we would go to, in all those villages Swami would show His Divine Presence. And in every village after we finish the Gram Seva and go back to Parthi or to Brindavan and report to Him, Swami will say, where did you do? I had to come, I had to do this, you didn't do this, you made that mistake, you made this mistake. In one village, we go for the survey and we forgot the road and we go away in some other road. And then suddenly a man comes on a cycle and he guides us to the village and shows us the exact Tashildar's office where we are supposed to get the survey map and then proceed to do the village seva there. And after two years, Swami says, you give big, big reports about what seva you did. You don't even know the road to go to the village. I had to come in a cycle to take you and show you the Tashildar's office. So like this, he is the doer. We may think we are doing, we are not doing. It requires absolute sharanagati and that is what God brings you down to. Ultimately, faith and surrender, I think, are the two greatest qualities that we need to cultivate.
to be able to understand the real message of divinity which is eternally speaking to us from within. In 2001, Swami had decided to grace Latur, Chakur with his divine visit. He gave us the great opportunity of taking his huge portraits which were placed in the sanctum sanctorum of that temple in Latur. And Mr. Uttam Rao Jadav, who was coordinating this entire visit, said, Bhagwan has asked you to bring those big portraits to Latur. And I remember I was returning back from Parthi one afternoon and I was running high fever. And I get a call from Brindavan saying, you are required to urgently come to the ashram. So we drove there in spite of my fever and Bhagwan was inside and uh, Sri Shivraj Patil was with Swami then going through the arrangements for the visit and I was waiting outside burning with fever and in the midst of all that conversation and planning that Swami was doing he calls the custodian of the ashram and tells him that boy has come who has to take the photos to Latur he is running very high fever give him this mango and ask him to have it tonight and get ready to go to Latur. So the custodian comes and gives me the mango and that same night according to Swami's will we consumed the mango. Next morning I was fit because it was his sankalpa. We land up at Brindavan. Swami gives minute instructions. He said I will arrange the vehicle. Everything I will do. Only one instruction is very important. He said both you and your wife have to carry that large portrait keeping it on your lap. You will start from Brindavan Ashram and only get down in the ashram in Latur. You will not stop anywhere on the way. You will not go here and there visiting anybody else after this work is done. You will come back straight to Brindavan and report to me. So this was a clear instruction. So with that instruction we go to Latur, we place that portrait there, we saw the, the bliss which was getting generated in the expectancy of Bhagwan's visit in July of 2011, uh, 2001. And then after the program and after all that was done, we came back and Swami of course was so gracious, he was so happy that those portraits had been given. That was an immense opportunity he gave. When he visited Latur in 2001, July, before he went through the organizers, he entrusted so many responsibilities. We were there during that visit and I have never seen this kind of fervor which was generated, tens of thousands of people coming to get a glimpse of divinity in those parched lands was amazing. It again sparked devotion and a conviction that you are ultimately in the realms of divinity. In 2001, there was one more very interesting thing which Bhagwan did in my life. I had joined a multinational company in 2000. And these people had posted me as head of their finance operations and wanted to transfer me to New York. So they asked me to join their corporate office in New York and the offices were in the World Trade Center on the 52nd floor. And I take the letter and I actually wound up most of it in Bangalore and I take the letter and go to Swami in Brindavan to just tell him that this offer has come Swami and I thought he'll be so happy when I tell him I'm going to America. So I was sitting with the letter and Swami comes. He takes the letter, leaves Swami and go and he threw that letter. And you know how it is, once in public Swami shouts at you like that or he scolds you then the whole gathering feels you are the greatest sinner on earth. So after that, and after that, Swami cut short his darshan, turns back, accepts Sarathi and goes away into Thrai. And people thought I had done such a heinous crime that they lost the privilege of a darshan. So after darshan, I was looked at like a convict. And I didn't know because I had not done anything wrong. I was wondering what is the mistake I had done. I just went to tell him that I am shifted to America and I have come to take your blessing and this is what he did. And then as you all know, the same year, 
the World Trade Center collapses. The entire staff in the 52nd floor died of that company. And I was there, left behind purely because of mercy, infinite mercy. He will ensure to take it to any extent. He will take it to any extent to ensure that you are protected. His protective hand, his grace, and his blessing is on all of us in equal measure. He will not let anybody, he may take us to the cliff. He may even allow us to dangle from the cliff, but he'll never let us down. This is the assurance of Bhagwan. He will never do it. Whatever happens in our life is for our good. I'm telling you, that was the biggest break in my life. At that age, I was trying to be getting into the financial capital of the world. They put me on the board of that company. It was the biggest dream for a finance professional. It was a billion dollar entity. I was supposed to be there right in the thick of things. And Swami says, you don't have to go. And everything just shattered. But when you look back, what had he done? It is mother's love. Only his love, nothing else. In 2006, I continued to work in that company. 2006, just before, I think it was October of 2006, after the yagna got over. Swami says, what work are you doing? I said, Swami, I work for this company. Leave the job. They had actually promoted me to the board. And I was taken onto the board of a company in a very senior capacity. Swami says, leave the job. And I said, Swami, but they will not leave me like that. I have to give six months notice. You know, you're trying to argue because you're still attached to your worldly roots. Swami said, you go back and send them a mail. They will accept it. Letter bury. They will accept it, very casually. So I go back to Bangalore, I send a mail, letter and all that. And within three, four days, I get a reply mail saying, we have accepted it, you have to continue for one year as a consultant. So I was actually crestfallen because you lost something so great. I mean, the greatest opportunity in a materialistic sense. And I go back to Prashanti Nilayam. And I think it was the ladies' day, November 19th, and Swami was distributing saris to everybody. And then he comes to the veranda. I have kept one sari for you also. I said, Swami, because now you have no work, you have to be at home. <laughs> so I have kept one sari for you also. I mean, this is like, you know, rubbing it in. You create the wound and then you rub it in. But then it is Bhagwan. I had enough evidence by then, whatever he does is only for our good and only for our good, nothing else. After that, he says, you are a CA. He said, yes, Swami. Small office, it go, practice madu. He actually said, small office. You do my work from now, he said. So it started from there. And he gave so many opportunities, so many opportunities in his infinite mercy and grace to work as a small instrument at his lotus feet from then till now. And I pray to him that it continues till the last drop of blood and the last breath in this body. Because whatever is happening with this body in this birth is entirely due to his mercy, his grace, and his love. In 2006 came the year of Atirudram. Atirudram was not in any way initiated or done by anyone else, certainly not by me. Athirudram was a prasadam. It was a divine boon conferred by Bhagwan on humanity. 
I remember there was a Yuva Vandana Youth Festival which we conducted in the month of May in Brindavan. At the end of that youth festival, on the last day, Swami permitted me to bring all the youth coordinators into Thrai Brindavan near his residence. And he said, I will talk to all of them tomorrow in the morning. You bring them all. So all the district youth coordinators, I took them all to behind where Swami's residence was. And he blessed them all profusely and all that happened. And finally, he suddenly looks at me and says, we have got to do some work in Puttaparthi. You come there next week. I was taken aback. I didn't know what is the work, what is it that he's hinting. And he said it so directly and clearly, and it was in the midst of all these boys surrounding him, looked directly and said, We have got Namgyeno Kelsaide, Prashanti Nilemge, next week Ba. So Swami left for Parthi on a particular Saturday, and I thought when Swami is leaving, I'll also follow. Because when he said, come to Parthi, why delay? So immediately go. So he also followed his car. And Swami stopped en route to Parthi in a place called Bagapalli. And I went there. Swami went into that temple in Bagapalli. And when he came out, I was at a distance. Swami used to call me Vinaya, not Vinay. So he said, hey Vinaya. Then he said, our work should be only on Somavara, not today. Somavara Puttapartikba. So I again didn't understand. But there was a prayer before this. This is what I want to share with all of you. What was the background for Athirudram? My wife and I had decided that we would conduct a complete reading of the Shiva Puran at home. Following the entire dictum written in the Shiva Puran, as it were, the strict adherence to whatever was mentioned in the methodology for reading that Shiva Puran. So for 18 days it took, it took us 18 days to read this Puranam every day for 9 hours. We would get up at 2 in the morning and start the whole thing exactly the way it was written in the Puran. We sat in our puja room. We bought two sets of the Shiva Puran in English. And the day we started reading, Amrut started flowing from Bhagwan's picture in the puja room. And on the last day when we completed the reading, the Amrut got formed in the form of an Om. And in the Shiva Puran, there is a khanda, a part which is called Sati Khanda. And in that Sati Kanda, there is an entire description of the annihilation of Daksha Prajapati's Yagna, where Daksha conducted this Yagna and Lord Shiva was insulted and Mother Sati had to forego and give up her life. And that angered Shiva and he became the Rudra and he annihilated the entire Yagna. And when we were reading this Puranam, time and again, time and again in the Puranam, I only got one thought, Shiva is not someone who should be associated with anger. Shiva is an extremely loving form of divinity. I really didn't understand why the word Rudra was even associated with Shiva. I said when he was so compassionate and so loving, how can the word Rudra, because the word Rudra itself means something anger, some kind of a forceful objective to a personality. I was wondering why was he even being addressed as Rudra? And then a thought came, why not look at conducting a yagna or a puja in front of our own Sai Shiva, which will give him so much of joy and happiness. Because when Daksha conducted that yagna, Shiva was so angry, but he cannot be angry. So I looked up into the texts and I consulted some very senior Vedic scholars, and then someone told me that Athirudra Mahayagnam is the highest form of worship to Lord Shiva. So I said, suppose we are able to offer this and Bhagwan is able to accept it, then that will give us and whole of humanity so much of joy to see Lord Shiva in that happy, blissful state. So with this objective, we wrote down the whole program 
the synopsis of what is Athirudram and all that. And on that Somavara, which he asked me to come, I carried this thing with me to Prashantilalayam. And I was seated there. On Somavara, Swami didn't call and talk to me. But on Somavara, he gave a lot of beautiful darshan, eye-to-eye -eye contact, smile, all that happened. But no chance of being called. So I wondered, I said, my God, what is happening? I brought this, he said Somavara, he should have called me anyway. The next day, he comes in the morning, Tuesday morning. He says, Nenne Someshwaran darshna aitu. Yuvattu bhashana agate. Yesterday was Shiva's darshan. Today is Shiva's bhashan. And it didn't strike me. He said it standing in the veranda. He was at the entrance and I was sixth or seventh sitting in the upper veranda. From there he calls out and he says this. And then he says, now you go in. And once I went in, he said, yen samacharamu. Then typically, you know, you want to get up and show your prowess. So I removed that envelope, removed the sheet from that. And I wanted to place in front of Bhagwan the program which we were offering, which we thought we have designed, we have conceived, we have thought about. So I brought up that sheet and wanted to show it to him. He just brushed it aside like this. He didn't even look at it. He just put his hand and he went into deep contemplation. And then he opens his eyes for a few seconds. He says, He says, this is the highest form of worship. I will have lot of anandam. I will get this yagnam done. The time has come for this yagnam to be performed. This was the declaration. We never proposed and gave a sheet to tell Swami that there is an Atirudra Mahayagnam which needs to be conducted. It was in his divine plan. It was part of his sankalpa. It was his will. We are nowhere in the picture. Nowhere. In fact, after that, on many occasions, Swami would introduce me to people and say, he did Atirudra Mahayagnam. I said, Swami, please, because we know that we were not instrumental. In fact, the whole Yagnam happened in spite of us, not because of us. He got into minute detailing. He got into minute planning. And this yagnam taught me three facets of Bhagwan. The first facet was his penchant for perfection, his detailing, his detailed involvement, how he would plan things. And that was an amazing lesson for so many of us leaders in the youth group and elsewhere on how you should conceive and plan a certain event and project. Everything was done by him, from scratch to the end. The second facet of Bhagwan, which I learnt in this Athirudram was his infinite compassion, his love, his motherly love, which was completely blossoming and coming forth every moment. And the third, I experienced divinity in its entirety. He had to show it off in its supreme form. These are the three facets of Bhagwan which I experienced during this yagnam. There were so many incidents. I don't think I will be in a position to narrate even a minuscule of all these, but I will attempt to at least bring out the most relevant ones. Right from the beginning, he blessed it on that morning. He said, after he said, this, is, this time has come for the yagnam. Then he said, you get the head priest after six weeks. I was in touch with the head priest because I had consulted him on the highest form of worship, so I only knew him. Before that, I had never done any program, any puja, any event with him. I went back to Bangalore and said, Sir, Swami is calling you and we are supposed to be there on 19th of June, 2006. On 19th June, in the morning, the head priest comes. Now, Swami gets, starts getting involved in the whole yagnam. The first step, selection of the head priest. He calls the priest. The priest was in the darshan line. I got up and said, Swami, head priest has come. He said, go out and bring him. 
So when I go out, this gentleman starts walking and coming towards the veranda. Swami took a few steps and came down in the veranda. And from a distance, as the head priest was walking and coming, Swami says, Oh, Ivra, he, I know him, I know his father, I know his grandfather, they are all worshipping me in my temple only. He is fit to do this yagnam. Selected, oh, he said. He selects the head priest. Then he called him in, and that was a fascinating discussion, which I will reveal to you when I talk to you about the divinity of Bhagwan. After that, the next thing which he did was, he calls me in one day, and then he calls all the principal trustees and the senior office bearers of the Satya Sai setup, the university vice chancellor, the other senior members who are seated right outside in the veranda. He calls them all in, and then he asks them, he wants to do one yagnam. Every time he wants to do, because he dealings himself from it. He wants to do one yagnam. He's saying we will do it in Kulwant Hall. I have not said it. This is Bhagwan. He wants to do it in Kulwant Hall. M. Chayali is asking. He's asking them. Each of them is a very great scholar, deeply devoted to Swami. They all gave their inputs. And many of them suggested different ways in which it should be done, at different locations in which it could be done. And after it was all completed, and they all left the room, I said, Swami, because you never know what Swami is up to, he can change things at any time for any reason. He said, Swami, so what have you decided about the yagnam? He says, you should always involve the elders. You must take them into confidence. You must call them and consult them and tell them what is happening. You must not do things directly. That is why I called them. You do the yagnam in Kulwant Hall. My blessings are there. Lesson in perfection. Selected the priest, consult the elders, work with the elders, work in unity. Next step. He's at it continuously. We didn't do any planning. You can't even think. There's no human comprehension in all this. Every stage was so meticulously done. Then this session happened, which you saw. Suddenly he says, one morning, you are going to get priests, but do they know to chant the Rudram? I said, Swami, now we are getting priests who we feel are proficient in chanting the Rudram. He says, you get a few of them, I want to hear them. If they chant properly, I will allow this yagnam to happen. So what we did, we got 40-50 of these priests who are most proficient. And I took a list of all the 137 priests. And in the top, these 40 priests were there. Swami said, get the whole list and get me the list of priests you are bringing. So I took the list of 137 and I took this list of 40 whom we are going to get for that sample chanting and placed both in front of Swami. And Swami said, Oh, these are experts in chanting. 40. I said, Yes, Swami. You are better. He says, Don't bring them. Who doesn't know to chant Rudram in this list? So I said, Swami, I don't know because this 40 is mixed in that. From the bottom you start the 40. So from the bottom 40, he said, those 40 you bring. Now I knew those are the 40 who are not so proficient in chanting. But Swami wanted those whom we felt were least proficient to chant in front of him. And if their quality came out very well, then the overall quality will be wonderful. That is that lot, few of them, who came into the Bhajan Mandir and Swami asked them to chant. I don't know if it was this scene. This happened, I think, in the morning of 2006. That happened a little earlier. 2006, August 9. That happened a little earlier. So they were all seated in the Mandir. And Swami brought out three points that morning, which was, you know, the only divinity can think and guide you like this. He was keenly observing the chanting. And before this chanting happened, I want to tell you one more thing. 
what I had done in all my cleverness. I had got this whole chanting done in Bangalore earlier, recorded the whole thing on one small tape recorder, and I took that thing to Parthi. And in the interview room, I told Swami, Swami, they chant fantastically, very nice, because I had to create the hype, because I wanted the yagnam to happen. I said, Swami, they are chanting beautifully, you please listen to this. Swami, instead of paying attention to listening to the Rudram chanting, he was more enamored with that equipment and he started playing with it like a toy. He was pressing this button, pressing that button and that thing was opening up suddenly. He said, Hai, how is it opening? I said, Swami, the Rudram chanting. And that thing he is putting with his left hand down. So he completely trivialized the whole objective of taking that recording. And he said, anyway they are coming, no, I will hear them. So the heart was beating faster. That morning came, we all sat there. And Swami keenly observed, heard the entire first and second Anuvakam chanted. Then he asked them to stop. He pointed out three things. First, he said, posture is not okay for all of them. They have to be straight. If you are not straight when you are chanting the Rudram, he says the energy level will get mixed inside the body. It can create negative impact on the person. You have to be straight when you are chanting. First. Second, eyes should not move, he said. I was shocked. He said they should not even flutter their eyes and move like this. The bhava should be that they are actually watching inward whereas their eyes are open and looking as if they are looking at something outward. The attention should be on the inward consciousness, not on the outward world. You should become inner focused, not outward bound. Though you are sitting and chanting the Rudra Mantra, because he said the energy generated by the mantra is so powerful that when you are focusing on yourself, the realization of the supreme consciousness within gets hastened. He said all the priests are sitting and chanting like how it is done for a show. So they have to chant the correct thing. The third thing, of course, Swami said, when you chant in a group, said it should come out as one voice. It should not sound Om Namo Bhagavate, Om Namo Bhagavate, Om Namo Bhagavate, three, four people chanting and somebody from there, somebody from here, somebody from there. It should be one voice. It should be one sound which should be heard. And he was keenly observing this. Then he called the priests, guided them, told them how it should be done. So lovingly, so much of patience, minutely he guided them. This is how he got the priests involved in the correct methodology of chanting the Rudram. Going further, there were some personal lessons which I learnt in perfection. I want to share a few this time. Swami had this uh, habit of testing you in his own way. So what he would do very often is, when he would come in the veranda, there was a kerchief on the chair. He would coolly put it down, somewhere near where I was sitting. Very gracefully, you would not even have noticed he has done it, but it will just fall down somewhere there. And when Bhagwan's kerchief falls down, you know, that's the most priceless position, right? So you go to take it like that. So I did it like that and took it and kept it with me. He watched it once. Then in my next visit when I went, again he did the same thing. Again I went and caught it like that. And Swami gave me a dirty look, very dirty look. And I was wondering what happened because this is love for the Lord. What is the mistake I have done? I mean it is Bhagwan's kerchief. I just rushed to get the kerchief. What is wrong? The next day he couldn't control himself. So he came in the afternoon. Very stern voice. What a go-go. Go inside. So I went in. Then inside the interview room, he again settles himself down. Now he has to teach you something. So God will go to any extent to do this. He sits and then pushes that kerchief down again. Clearly puts it down. 
and again I rushed to catch the kerchief. And Swami says, Chi, Chi, stop. A kerchief allu prana ide. There is prana even in the kerchief. Why do you go and rush and grab it like this? Can you not hold the kerchief properly in your hand? There is prana even in the kerchief. Suppose somebody holds you like this, how will you feel? You should understand everything has got prana in it. This is the lesson. But he used the kerchief to drive home this supreme lesson. This is another great lesson which I learnt. Very often you take to Bhagwan something. Do you have a piece of paper? Something. You want to show him a letter or some card or some invitation or something like that. So during the yagna preparatory days, there were a lot of things which we had to take guidance and clearance from Swami. So one such day I went and uh, when he was in the veranda, there was a card. So I was holding it like this, Swami, to read. So that it is easy for him to read it. And he suddenly got angry. He just turned his face, he moved. And I was wondering what happened. Then he finishes around, comes back, says, go inside. So I go in and then Swami says, don't you know how to hold a letter? I said, Swami, what happened? If you hold it like this, how will I read it? You are covering here, you are holding here, how will I read it? This is not the way to hold a letter. You must hold a letter like this. The hand should be in the back. I should be able to see the complete contents of the letter. Hingit kondre? Hingit kobeko. I felt, my God. That is the level of perfection and detailing to which God can go to. And then we made it a point, every time you go to Bhagwan, you are holding a letter, you are holding it like this and you are conscious that you have to hold it like this. Bhava. It was Ashadi Ekadashi celebrations in Prashantinilayam, 2006. I think the artist was Richa Desai. Uh, Richa Desai or something. Richa Sharma was performing. Swami witnessed the entire program. He was so happy with the artist. He, I think, materialized something for her and took pictures and all that. Arati was accepted. After Arati was accepted and Swami had to retire back, before that, he calls me inside. This is after Arati. It's probably nearing 6.40, 6.45 in the evening. And when I went in, Swami said, how did you like the program? So I said, see, when Swami has showered on the artist and created a chain and all that, you have to be at your diplomatic best. So I said, Swami, the program was wonderful. You go on. Swami said, I have no, I don't mean any offense to the artist, obviously, because those words came from divinity himself. Swami said, when you sing, there should be bhava. Bhava tumba mukhya, he said. Ragam, talam can be there, but bhava is very important. And Swami sang Payoji Mene that evening. And when I was listening to him singing, as he was singing that bhajan, Mirabai's, Mirabai manifested in his hand, a beautiful figure of Mirabai. And Swami said, Mirabai Bandlu. And he showed. And he said, the love with which she sang for me in that yuga, I remembered her today and she has again appeared. This is what bhava can do to God. This is what the purest feeling from within can do to the Lord. You can attract him only with purity from within. Bhava. So Swami said, this entire yagnam, all the preparations, everything should be done with the purest bhava. And the bhava should be of that metal which Mirabai had for me. So to explain that concept of purity with which the whole yagna should be offered, he created this whole incident to just drive home that one point. Rudram. How should the Vedic mantram Rudram be chanted? He heard the boys 
he heard the priests we got those 60 priests separately in the mandir all this happened one afternoon swami came he called one of the priests and he called me took us in and he told that priest chant the rudram so he started chanting and swami in between kept on asking him to pause and he said it has to be like this it has to be like this it has to be like this he went on correcting him and then swami said nanu rudram helboda he asked him shall i chant the rudram it was the greatest privilege to watch lord shiva chanting the rudram extolling himself swami chanted the first anvaka fully those were days dear brothers and sisters when the outside world felt that swami was weak he was not able to talk forcefully swami was on a wheelchair i witnessed it that afternoon swami chanted the entire first anvaka without even pausing for a breath the last part of the first anvaka is not so easy you have to pause and swami said when you become the rudra the rudra becomes you and he starts chanting you stop chanting you have to identify yourself with the lord when you are offering the prayers to him if you feel the lord and you are separate then your effort is determined by your praptam you have to become the lord and then offer the prayer to yourself such a great truth and for this he purposely did it in front of that priest so that that priest takes the message out and then that whole group which was there they chanted it phenomenally phenomenally because they said sir what is this we are chanting till now thinking that there is an object called lingam there is an object called shiva there is something which is outside of us and we are worshiping that object when we start feeling that we are that object and worship it the whole methodology and the bhava with which you do it is different this was another lesson food there so many but i am just trying to bring out a few food arrangements during the yagnam he had arranged specially food to be provided for all the priests in a separate place cooks were arranged all the arrangements were done by bhagwan and swami said what you have to do morning afternoon evening three times in the day you should go to the kitchen which was set up by the priest for the priests you should check up what are the provisions they are using in the morning what is the menu of the morning what provisions have been consumed for the afternoon what was the menu for the afternoon what provisions consumed for the evening what was the menu for the evening and when the priests come and sit for lunch or dinner or breakfast they should not be made to wait they should be served promptly food is god god is food don't waste food he said put up the board everywhere and so every day religiously i would go in the morning afternoon evening and we try to do our best at a human level though we are supposed to realize that he is doing it and then that divine energy percolates through us in that activity but the human brain brain restricts itself not knowing who it is the question has to be asked who am i we don't ask that when we don't ask that we become weak we become human once we understand who we are then the divine energy springs forth so we were doing this activity routine manner and one afternoon the priests were all seated and they all had their lunch got up and went that afternoon swami comes and then he says food della arrangements chennagi aagta idya the moment swami asks you a question like that you know something has gone wrong because you know he will ask it in a certain way and his way of asking will be so beautiful actually but you know somewhere you have made a mistake so i said swami to the extent we know it has all been going on properly then swami said no today in the afternoon i was there he says one priest was waiting 
for rice to be served. He went on waiting, his leaf was empty and all of you are walking up and down, up and down, up and down like lords and nobody bothered to even look at his leaf and give him the rice immediately. I had to immediately keep the rice vessel near him and he was able to get the rice. And you know who that priest is? He is the head priest of the Chamundi temple in Mysore. If he goes and tells Chamundeshwari, what will happen to you? <laughs> Instantly I said, Swami, but when we are with Saishwari, why should we worry? This is the detailing. Nothing escapes his attention. He is present here. He is the eternal witness to every talk. He is the eternal witness to every congregation, every bhajan, every Vedic session, everything that happens around the world. Nothing can be done without Bhagwan knowing about it because He is us. He is not something which is external, which needs to come and prove that He is present. He is in us and we are Him. And it is as simple as that. One more instance. I am sorry if I am keeping you all, but this is something which is... It's okay. Swami decided suddenly one day to distribute watches to all the priests during the Yagna. So I was called home and in Yajur Mandir Swami says, Swami wants to give a gift to all the priests. So he showed me the box, beautiful watches were there. When can we give these watches, he asked. So I said, Swami, whenever you will it, we'll make arrangements. This conversation was around 12.30 in the afternoon. Hmm, he said, and he retired. Then he sent message that we'll do it after one or two days. So I also got ready accordingly. I told our coordinators, I said, Swami is likely to do this watch distribution. Let us keep a list ready and all, who knows when he will ask. So they kept the list ready. That afternoon he comes in the car and he gets down in the veranda and he signals for some boxes to be removed. The yagnam has to start in the afternoon. And Swami says, table ella ready a gitko. I was wondering which table. I am distributing watches now. I got a shock. I said, Swami, I, we have not made any arrangements. I didn't know anything. And Swami asked, how many priests are there? I said, Swami, 137. Because 137 priests are supposed to be there. Swami says, 137 idara. He said, yes, Swami. Sure? He said, yes, Swami. 137 idara. Again he asked. I said, Swami, 137 idara. And, but I was now not sure. <laughs> then the watches come out. Quickly the table is set. Swami goes into the interview room. He comes out. And he says, all 137 priests are sitting there? He said, yes, Swami. Then I told Swami, we'll take the box, Swami, you bless it, and we'll go and distribute it to all the priests. I thought that was an easy way of escaping out of the fact that suppose 137 guys are actually not there, you know, then you'll have to get showered with Rudram. So, I said, Swami, we'll take the box and we will go and distribute it. Beda, beda, beda. Michaeli, one on the name on in announce model. Each name you announce, they will come and I will give it to them. Then my heart sank. I said, Boss, now if 137 guys don't show up here, you're finished. Because it is not that you are scared of Bhagwan. That is the level of perfection. That is the minute detailing to which he gets into. He was having a lesson in mind to teach, which I'll tell you what he did at the end of this. And then on that day in the afternoon, luckily that brother had kept that list ready and that chap, what he did in that list, he had highlighted a few in red and some in green and all that he had done and given me. And Swami is seated there 
and he gives me the list and I open it and see all these red and green lines on it and I don't know what it means. Does it mean those red lines are not there or the green lines are there? And Swami says, hmm, hmm. <laughs> so I started reading. And each time I'm reading, I'm hoping I was never so desperate to see that priest getting up. <laughs> so when I say, Raghava Shastri, somebody gets up from somewhere, I said, oh, thank you, Swami. <laughs> Padmanabha Swami, somebody gets up and comes, I say, thank you, Swami. And Swami, after the 14th or 15th or 20th is over, inna yeshti dare. How many more? How many more? So at some stage what I thought, I'll become a little more smarter. So I started reading of the names in quick succession. Raghava Shastri, Gopal Sharma, Manjana Sharma, like that. So that I thought one, two, three, they will keep getting up. In that process, somebody who is not there will be overlooked. <laughs> Swami straight away says, slow, slow. <laughs> And then, finally, I found 133 were there. Four were not there. And when the 126th or 27th was being given by Swami, Swami, is, while giving that watch to that priest, He says, Four watches you remove and keep it inside. I didn't realize. Later on, when the whole list is over, 133 only are there. Four was extra. He said, remove those four and keep it extra. Then Swami gave his lesson. I thought I'm going to be blasted. Swami will get upset. He will get up and walk out. So I went and said, Swami Tappaitu Kshamis Bidi. I thought it was 137, but only 133 are there. Tappaitu Swami, Tappaitu Swami. I went on. Swami immediately, this is such a compassionate Lord, no? He will melt. Nothing can melt Him more than the cry of a devotee. Whether it is in a Vedam chanting, whether it is in a bhajan, you have to cry. Today when the Shiva bhajans were going on, you, you felt Bhagwan. So the cry of the devotee is the only thing He will respond to. Swami said, what you should have done, when they leave the shed, you should take account there. When they enter the hall, you must take account again. 137 priests left the shed. Four of them did not enter the hall. Those four are in the shed now. You give these watches to them. They are not sitting in this crowd. You should have taken account there and you should have taken account here. This is a lesson. This is a lesson in perfection, detailing. Like this, to what extent, which avatar in which yuga had gone into this kind of detailing? This has never happened. This is a small incident of a certain event which happened in those 85 glorious years of his physical presence. Umpteen number of events like this have happened. I am sure millions of instructions like this has been given by him. He has got into detailing to this extent and to far greater extents in so many other cases. Only to drive home one point. God is for you, with you, in you, around you, behind you, above you and every time in you. So you cannot do anything without his knowledge. You have to become one with him. His love I don't have time. I may not be able to share instances about the love and the divinity, but I want to certainly share with you the instance of his supreme divinity which he revealed during that on multiple occasions, but one incident which was so beautiful. The lingam for the yagnam had been determined. It was a white color lingam which was got. And during the process of getting this lingam ready for the yagnam, one day Swami called me and said, there is a devotee who has brought a green color maragatha lingam also and he has offered that for this yagnam. Shall we keep that lingam? He asked. Now, he wanted to test two things here. One, are you attached to the lingam 
Are you attached and obsessed with that object called the lingam? White only? Are you able to also understand and submit to the will of the Lord? Two things. So I said, Swami, whatever you bless, we will go ahead with that. Swami said, I cannot tell what lingam to be used. Head priest has to decide. So I said, Swami, we will ask the head priest to decide how should we do it. So Swami said, you bring the head priest to the house. Let him decide. So that evening, Swami has neatly arranged the stage, no? He has to keep everything ready because for him, he had a lesson to drive home. A table is kept inside Yajur Mandir. He has placed the green lingam. Next to that, another table. He has placed the white lingam. And when you enter the mandir, Swami is seated on the chair in the first room, facing the door. Behind it is the room. And behind that is the table on which the lingams are kept. Swami is facing the door. So we entered. And Swami says, I said, Swami, you have to bless and tell which lingam we should choose. He says, Ilala, head priest too. Head priest has to decide. So the head priest, I requested him, sir, you at least decide which lingam. So we both go behind, to the next room, behind. Swami is in the front room, looking at the door. And from here, Swami's commentary is going on. And we are inside, trying to look at the lingams. Hmm, lingam nodi aita, from here. And there the priest is looking at both the lingams. And then the priest is looking at the green lingam, he's looking at the white lingam, he's looking at the green lingam. He's not able to make up his mind. So Swami says, priest ke yao lingam ishta ito. He's from here, he is looking at the door and he's chanting. He's going on telling this. So I ran to Swami and I said, Swami, instead of all this, if you come and you select the lingam, it will be done, Swami. The priest is not able to do it, you please come. Beda, beda, beda. Priest, how are you? Head priest, how are you? Natak, so much Natak. Then we go back. What had happened was, every time this head priest is looking at that green lingam, he is seeing one black spot on it. And I am looking at the green lingam, there is no black spot on it. It is clean, beautiful Margatam. So Swami calls the head priest, Hey, gide lingamu. Swami, chenna gide. But in his heart of hearts, there was a black spot, which he didn't want. Then he asked me, which lingam is okay? I said, Swami, both the lingams are okay. Then he says, lingamali spots in adredia. Spots in adredia. He is asking. He is looking at the door all the while. So again, the head priest goes back to see, no spots on the green lingam. Clean, beautiful. White lingam, looks at it nearby, beautiful, nothing. He comes back. Swami, clear agide, Swami, he says. Spot, yaudu ilva. No spot. Tirga hogi, check madi. Again, go and see. Again, he goes. This time, he again sees, he finds a black spot on that lingam. This goes on for two, three times. Swami had some two and a half months before itself, decided clearly, that it has to be a white lingam for the yagnam. He clearly told us. He said, white and re purity, white lingam itko, all that he said. So when the lingam came also, he blessed it and all that. But when this devotee came, he cannot now tell the devotee that he has given it with a lot of devotion and bhakti. God cannot reject a devotee's devotion. So he had to do an atak. So what was the Natak? He used the head priest. So he created a black thing on the green lingam. And then the head priest goes and sees that black mark again, big black mark, comes back and says, Swami Shastrad Prakara, Yaudu Mark Kirbardu Lingam Mele, that also a black mark should not be there. Black mark is Swami, a lingam beda Swami, he said. So Swami is telling me, head priest held either. Head priest is telling that that lingam is not okay. Swami ke Allah serine. Head priest held either. So it got established that the head priest had decided it was the white lingam and not the green lingam. This is what 
he will do. This is the divinity which will keep on coming forth, time and again. Because the one thing I felt was, if you look at the human body, can we actually bend this hand behind? Can we take it back like this? You can't. We have to take it like this. We can't go inward. Can the eyes see the eye? Can the mouth talk to the mouth? Can the ear hear the ear? Can the nose smell the nose, nose uh, the smell? All these senses that are given to us by God are outward bound. They are not inward bound. The greatest maya is on our creation itself. The way in which the human body has been given to us by God is the greatest maya which is playing on us. Everything in us is outward bound. Nothing is inward bound. That is why the avatar, the guru, why we say guru? Guru. Gunatita rupa varjita. The dispeller of ignorance. The guru comes to dispel this ignorance and say, go inward. Go within. Don't look at the objective world. Look at the subjective self. Understand the one which is within. That is the reality. I think, brothers and sisters, this is the greatest message of Bhagwan that we need to carry with us. That we need to look inward. Go inward and seek the divinity which is within us. It is like recently I saw the radio side message about the plantain tree. You have got the leaf. You have got the flowers. You have got the plantain leaf which can be used to serve food. You have got the flowers from a plantain tree which can be used as a vegetable. You have got the trunk which can be used to bind things. But you also have the fruit, the banana, for which you actually plant the plantain tree. Similarly, in the human body also, the core thing is the self, the paramatma which is within. None of these senses really matter. The body will shed itself one day or the other. It is not permanent. It is transient. This is what has happened with the avatar. But the core being the self is what we need to turn towards. That inward journey is our duty now. Because we are the most blessed and the most fortunate people ever, ever, ever to have been born in any yuga. Because we got attracted to this form, to this reality, to this consciousness called Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba. I would have loved to go on and on and on because Swami is an unending story, unending saga. It can just keep on going on. But for constraint of time, I think I need to stop here. And thank you once again, Abhinav team, the students. I feel the students are the most blessed lot. I've had so many arguments, verbal duels with Swami connected to students. I was mentioning to it one of our brothers today, and he would always say, Hey, our Namoro, Ninu Namau Nila, you are not mine, they are mine. Because you are not a student. So I used to say, Swami, what is this? Just because they are students, they are given so much of importance. One day he was giving safaris. I said, Swami, you make them sit in the front, they are chanting Vedam, they are chanting Bhajan for you. Everything is student, student, student. Where are we? So one day he comes with safaris to distribute to students and he lifts the safari because he has to give it to students only. He says, Sar, safari kodla students gay. That is the love he had for the students and he'll continue to have. And it is amazing that this program called Samarpan took shape, blossoming, and I'm sure it will reach millions and millions and millions of people because his message of love selfless service has to reach to every nook and corner of humanity and I think this is one of the greatest sadhanas which is being undertaken by the alumni I really am extremely grateful once again and from the bottom and innermost recesses of my heart I thank Swami how do you thank him when I said thank you Swami once he said Tai ge thanks ha, he said you will say thanks to your mother how do you thank him what do you do with this God you can't thank him, you can't shout at him, you can't ignore him. Nothing you can do. You have to live with him. You have to live with this phenomenon called Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba. Sai Ram. Yes,